We're talking about Christian Christianity, and we're talking about how the Bible presents Christianity as a way of life, as a victorious uh, narrative, victorious story. And that way, by following Christ, there is also consistency that the way that you live is the way God designed the world uh, and that you might live not a life of defeat, destruction, or unraveling, but a life of victory and truth. So that's why we're calling it, we just call it consistent Christianity. Does Christianity offer something that can stabilize me and walk me in victory through life? And, and James uh, comes out and says, yes, that's true. In the first message, we talked to, we, we saw from James and talked about um, your, the approach of trials, how we're all going to come under trials, and that we need to count those trials with joy because that means God's working and that God's sustaining us. So it's really uh, having victory under trials. The second message, James is moving in more in another area, and, he's, and he says, listen, I know that some of you are lacking the understanding of the gospel and God's will, and you're lacking what he calls wisdom. This is, you're not discerning the voice of the Holy Spirit or the truth coming from the scripture. You're lacking this wisdom, but God's eager to give it to you. You need to ask for it because you're not enduring your trials well. You're enduring them under, you're not counting them as joy. You're not looking for a future answer. You're struggling. You're under confusion. He was concerned for those that were in confusion for wisdom. And so that was last week. This week, James goes a little bit deeper in his concern. His concern pivots to those uh, not who are a bit confused and not who are staying steady under trial. He goes to those who are literally failing in it and who are looking for different gospels or different ways out or different solutions to all the messages and uh, all the temptations that they have around them uh, to change their allegiance. Last week we talked about the two paths. You have an allegiance for God or for this world. And so it's, it's, it's talking about being a single-hearted, singly devoted person to God, but yet there were people, because of their circumstances economically, because their careers were on the line, their jobs, their houses, their lives, they changed allegiances to be able to buy more of this world's security. They traded out their faith for more of this world's security. Their Christianity was not stable. It wasn't consistent. James says now there are some who are literally abandoning the faith altogether, and he speaks to that. We're going to look at six verses today that speaks to it. The first point that James comes to, and he says, he wants you not only to resist temptation, there's times where by your own will and by your own flesh, you can come and experience temptation and, res- and, and kind of put up a, a fight, a resistance to it. And, um, and then when you get tired or when you just don't feel it anymore, you don't have the fight in you anymore, your will fails you. James says, no, there's something more to the Christian life that empowers you to live in victory, not just resisting temptation, but conquering it, overcoming, living victoriously in it. Occasionally, of course, in churches, we mention temptation, but we often don't preach to it like we once used to, I think, in in many of our churches. And James says there is a way, and the first thing is you have to identify. How do you conquer temptation? You first have to identify when it's showing up in your life. And the way that you do that is by making sure that you're not blaming God. All right, so we'll just start with the first point, and then we'll get into the verse and unpack it. Christians conquer temptation first by not blaming God for the circumstance. Not in the middle of the temptation, not at the beginning of the temptation, but at the end. Because usually at the end of a temptation is when our story, our desire, our want isn't working out the way that we had planned it. We're being let down. Our path was a failed path. We made poor decisions. We didn't follow God. And here's the consequences. And now we look at the consequences, and James knows it's a natural human tendency to blame everybody and everybody else, especially the people closest to us, and especially God, as a natural human reaction when things don't work out the way we desired them. That's just plain and simple how it is. And we do that, don't we? We we want to unload our own personal guilt or lack of pleasure that we're experiencing in our heart because our paths 
are leading to dead ends. We'll blame anybody. We'll, we might blame our spouse. We might blame our best friend. Uh, we might blame our children. If your children happen to be in Virginia, in the United States, then you're often blaming the dog for everything. And my dog has been very disobedient since my children left our home a few weeks ago. So we want to just shift. It's not me. <laughs> I'm perfect. <laughs> it's not me. I'm not the problem here. It's the way that the situation is set up. And as you go through and, and start blaming people that really aren't at fault, the, the natural course of blame is always going to arrive at God's door. Because he runs our world. He, he created us. It's, it's his world. It's our life. It'll always end there. Why? Because we come from our mom and dad, Adam and Eve. And that's exactly what they did. Eve had desire, she's tempted, she takes, she gives it to Adam, Adam listens to her, doesn't follow God's word, they had one command, one command, you know, one command, and it was just don't take communion at this tree, especially when I'm not here. <laughs> the, the quest for knowledge, or to be equal, to know as God knows, and so, boy, that was such a temptation, and sure enough, she takes the fruit, passes it out of me, et cetera. And then when God comes and asks Adam specifically, here's the man, he says, it is the woman that you gave to me. Well, then she gave me to eat. And so what could I do? I ate. So there's two sequences in this chain. And then it finally arrives back at God. God, you made her, yeah, she's beautiful, but she's, she's evil. Do you see that, God? Eve, she's great, wonderful, but she's evil. And see, he's... He's also a participant in sin and rebellion. He fell in temptation just as much, but everybody's pointing the finger and then finally went to the snake and then it went back to God, right? Satan. Look at this pivot that James makes here. He starts in verse 12 in this section. Happy, content, satisfied is the man, or stable is the person who remains steadfast under trial. Okay, after he's remained under trial, he can look back at the path he has covered, for when he has stood the test, when his life is complete and he has stayed the trial, if you will, he has followed Christ, Christ honors him. Christ thanks him. It's a beautiful picture. He crowns him with honor of saying, in your temporary life on earth, you followed me. I give you the crown which is life, eternal life, which will never be threatened. No more tears, no more shame, no more pain. I will give you the crown, which is life. God has promised that to us now. God never lies. God will deliver it to us later. For those who love him, the word love there means serve, or their loyalty is in allegiance in consistent service uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he pivots in verse 13. Take a look. Let no one say that when he is tempted. Okay, so here he's talking about the blessed man who's remaining under trial. Verse 13 those of you who are not remaining under trial, it's, it's showing up because the first reaction is you're blame shifting. When you do it, when you're being tempted, that you are being tempted by God. So notice it's in quotation marks. That was probably a phrase that he was hearing. God's just putting me in circumstances. I can't help it. He made me this way. He put me in this family. If it wasn't for my parents you know, who didn't parent me well, then, well, I wouldn't sin so much in this way, okay? If it wasn't for my career, if it wasn't for my ec economic status, if it wasn't for this, then, well, I just wouldn't have done this. See, it's always somebody else that's generating this, but it's really, if God had just put me in a different life, in a different world, I wouldn't be tempted or sin. And so James has heard this, and he knows that this is possibly being repeated in their hearts. And it's becoming the justification excuse for it to be able to point back at God. And if you're finding your heart too, just let's just pause there. Guys, if we're finding our hearts becoming critical, becoming judgmental, um, uh, always look at, pointing, uh, angry at others, etc. And we're just kind of storing that up inside what we're really going to do is we're going to keep deferring that finally back to God. That's a sign that you are not happy with the way your life is going or the way that God is writing the story of your life. 
but he has a plan that is glorious. We aren't seeing it yet. And James will talk about it here in a little bit. So please know, if you're seeing yourself, okay, if you're seeing yourself really starting to blame or always looking at someone else or pointing that finger, which is so easy to do, and we, and we hide it, and if you see yourself doing that, then know right here, I won't conquer temptation. Temptation will actually conquer me. I'm, I'm opening myself wide up to self-destruction. And I'm actually not going to do the will of God and what he desires for me to do uh, because I'll be tempted. Because James wants us to realize, and he puts two foundational truths here. God himself cannot be tempted. The, the idea here in, in Greek is that God can have, because he is so holy and pure, he can actually not have anything to do with something that is reprehensible, disgusting, morally wicked, wrong, or of darkness. His, it, it, it's like he has, his holiness is his force field. His glory is his, is his strength. Anytime it, he comes near, he will have nothing to do with it. He can see through evil. He knows it is destructive and he will abstain from it so he won't touch it and he doesn't use it. And he doesn't use it against us. He does not take capricious decisions or things or objects and then bait us with them in temptation. Okay? So once we start believing correctly about God, then we'll stop blaming God for what's happening in our lives. We'll pull back and we'll start to admit who we are. And so Christians, to defeat temptation and live consistently, we are simply saying, wait a minute, Lord, I can own up to my sin because you've given me the Savior. I can confess because you've given me Jesus and he's taken this on himself, but I'm responsible the way James presents it to us in this literature, the wisdom literature is, it's not God who makes you sin, and it's definitely not the devil who makes you sin, because a lot of times we go to that extreme. All right? And again, to repeat, just so you know, it's not your dog that's making you sin, okay, if you want to blame the dog. Okay? Let no one say it's God. When you get a great image of the sovereign, providential, glory-working Holy Father from heaven in your heart, and you fill up with that, those temptations get really small. And his holiness living in us repel darkness and temptation, okay? And blame goes the other way. It actually attracts it, okay? So there's his first point, just as we're kicking this off in verse 13. The second point, let's jump into that, is Christians conquer temptation by exposing temptation for what it is. So now we're going to get down into a little bit of the meat of what uh, these terms mean and what temptation is like so we can define it instead of just glossing over uh, this idea and this concept. What he says is, it's not God, so now when we come with human responsibility, we're responsible. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. The word lured is a verb. And in the, it's a compound word. In the middle of the word is the word bait. He is baited. And that's why I think the translators use the word lured. He is enticed by his own desire, called out. Or it's the desire is calling out of his heart and propelling him toward the object or the function or the relationship of temptation before him. Okay. The word desire is often used by Paul and John, James, and Peter. It is the word epithumea. Epi, if you can think of it, is like a circle. We use the word epicenter or epicenter, okay? So you can think of it as like there's a circle where the center of an earthquake or something took place. Ground zero, we call that. Desire, epithumea is desire circled around me, okay, in every direction. Epithumea is a good synonym to the word obsession. We get obsessed over it. James is basically using a word to describe saying there's um, a bunch of control freaks in us that are all freaking out <laughs> for control. We're driving for it. That's desire. We want to have, to consume, to obtain, um, 
to have pleasure. And so we're seeking our pleasure, our happiness, whether that's through a function, whether that's through a relationship, whether that's through an object, or whether that's through fame as well. These are all functional saviors that we're drawn toward. The word enticed is that word for, uh, for bait. So I have a picture of what that looks like here. And uh, just in just a couple seconds, uh, that fish is going to realize that's not food. <laughs> It wants all of it, but what's the problem? The fish does, is not aware that inside, hidden, is the catch, is the hook. It's all about perspective, isn't it? To the fish, it's all about that bait. To the, uh, to the fisherman, it's all about the hook. How do you lure that fish in? And there, it, this is a sense of that temptation of, what, of what's taking place. James says, temptation is everywhere. Now, you might be tempted by a lot of different things. It depends on where the affections of your heart are pointing and where you're going, where your goals, where you, what you dream about. What that little voice talks about when everything kind of calms down for five minutes of calm in the day that you get it, if you get five minutes. And you might be tempted by money. And so James says, this is what it looks like. Okay, You might be like this guy. Today, uh, we have Italian elections. And you should be aware of any politician promising money, there's probably some hook that's in there. You just can't give away other people's money without some kind of hook, okay? So just a little warning there. But this is the desire. So I found that. I thought it was cute, so I put it up there. Uh, temptation, he says, is out there. It's everywhere. It might be money like on this, uh, but let me try to illustrate it uh, simply like this. Take a look at this picture. Beautiful picture, right? And we say, oh, wow, I would love to be there in springtime. Here in Italy, uh, we have lots of scenes like this when it comes to springtime. This is a beautiful picture. Would you agree? Yeah, it's, it's lovely. And, and it's drawing. It draws us. We, we want to be there and experience this. We take pictures. We want selfies there, okay? The question is, what kind of people would say, that's not a beautiful picture to me. That's not where I want to be. Who would say that that's not beautiful to them? Little bit of a trick question, of course, but just think about it. Apart from Vladimir Putin, who wants to just blow everything up. Okay, who else would say, that's not a place I want to be? What do you think, Natalie? Thank you. She's exactly right. People with allergies. How many of you guys suffer from allergies? Anybody? Oh, man. Rich, too? I didn't have any problems with allergies in my life. I didn't know what they were, you know? And um, I have friends who talked about it all the time, and so I was like, all right, well, it stinks to be you, but you know, I'm just going to press on. So I got here in Italy, and everything blossoms in the spring and also in the fall. I learned that too. And so there's so many things blossoming. We don't even know the names of the plants. We just go yellow on a stick, pink on a stick, white on a stick. It's just everywhere. And uh, when I hit about mid-30s, there we, I would just get around March, and I, I didn't figure out it was allergies. And for years, I was like, oh, man, so I'm, oh, it must be change of temperatures. I've got that sore throat. It's all scratchy. And my eyes are just burning. And then um, I had all the signs, but I couldn't self-diagnose, right? And then the worst thing for me, I don't know about you, is fatigue, extreme fatigue. All I wanted to do when I get allergies is just lay down and sleep in the flowers, <laughs> you know? It's horrible. James kind of pictures it like this. And I know that this illustration breaks down, but it works like this. The, you don't see the pollens, really, that are going into your eyes, your ears, your nose, and in your mouth. You just don't see them. But they're everywhere in springtime. And uh, they're so small, a little bit like coronavirus. OK, remember corona? Yeah. Uh, so it, you just don't really see it. It invades you. It changes your life. It makes you sick. And James says, listen, the objects and the possibilities of temptation, they are everywhere like pollen in springtime. And for some of you, you are more susceptible to one kind of pollen, and others of you are more susceptible to something else. Different seasons, different ways. And so some people come in and go, oh, that's not a big deal. But for somebody else, yeah, you know, maybe that glass of alcohol, that might be a really big, bad temptation for them. Might not be for you. You see what I'm saying? There's temptation everywhere. And uh, temptation to fail. And it's a bit like this. And so to increase uh, this this idea, then desire, that's that epithumia, that's that obsession, that 
inside of me desire. By the way, to help this metaphor that he's using, all of these verbs and words are in feminine. And so I think you'll figure out why. Desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. When sin, it is fully grown, it brings forth death. Okay, so there's a process that's going to be taking place here. Here's desire. So what is, let let me try to repeat it using that picture again. The temptation is out there. Desire is in here. And the two of them are going to mate. I don't want to be too graphic here today. James is, okay? So (laughs) I'm trying to not to be, but he is. And he's using this metaphor. And so the two of them will get together. And it is my Desire to write my life the way I want it. We say, make my own destiny and, if you will, bring pleasure to myself. That's in me. So that is, that's high radar. It's on. It's looking. And then there's all these different temptations out there. And in any way, all of a sudden, it just comes. It comes out of nowhere. And it just, if you will, seeds that desire that's boiling in my, in my heart. And the seed then turns into a, uh, a passion to obtain. O- obtain anything. It could be more fame or it could be object. It could be more money, whatever we're talking about. That desire now is impregnated in me and it's growing something, okay? And that, when it does give birth, at the moment it gives birth, it is sin. It is hideous. Fully grown, it turns into death. We'll we'll get to that in a second. But what you have is, you have a birth of a monster. You have just brought forth Frankenstein. Okay? I I came up with that all on my own last night. Frankenstein is birth because out of my life, it's that first step because these are baby sins. And I am not, pro-abortion, I am, uh, yeah, I am pro-life, I am against abortion, except for this case. This, all babies, by the way, all babies are beautiful, right? All babies are precious and treasure and lovely, but not this one. This is an ugly baby, and we need to call the baby ugly, okay? No, literally, we need to call it for what it is. It is a desire of me that says, I'm not going to walk in the way that Christ has given me or conform my life to his because it's too costly. It's too painful. I don't desire that. So the whole world has done that. And we've all taken part in this. And when we are tempted all over the world, so the world's answer to this then is, do it if you feel like it. If it feels good, then do it. That's the answer. Let it be. You know, you got to take care of you. you got to love you. Of course you do, because we always do. We love ourselves way too much. (laughs) The Bible comes in, and James says, no, we need to love God, and God is going to put a cross in this, and that's what he did. He came into our world, and he laid himself down. He put a cross into our sinful world, He stuck a cross in it, and the cross was God's answer, a call to the world to say, stop. No, I'm going to give you victory. And then Jesus went down into death. He made death die on that day. He killed death. He rises from the grave, and he says, now a new people who can live in victory. And that's what he's bringing. He's bringing life. James says sin works the opposite direction. It works through temptation. The birth of all these sin babies are there. Now, here's why we need repentance. And here's why you have to stop it. You can't let it grow. Because the word word for when it is fully grown is the idea of maturity. It, It starts out as a baby. In other words, when a baby comes into this world, it doesn't yet know how to operate. Uh, It doesn't yet know... (laughs) I, should, I gotta be careful about this. Doesn't yet know how to control things until it learns how to control mom at night and needs food, right? Uh, it's a very quick learning curve, isn't it, for our kids? So, uh, babies are, they need to be nurtured, they need to be taken care of. 
They're not controlling their world. They're not in control of their world. But they're a part of us. And this is why I appreciate the metaphor that he's giving. And he'll, he'll continue it here. Because what he's saying is, here is a baby of you. It's a part of you. It was your story, your dream, your investment. And you had a great ideal. And maybe it didn't work out, but you are pushing against God, and here it is. And that's why often, often we want to hide sin. Or we overlook it, or we're like, this is really not that big a deal. And what we're doing is we're actually hiding that sin baby, Frankenstein today, and we're hiding him, and we don't want anybody to see that thing, and so we put him behind us, and, and, and it won't for a while. The problem is the longer that that kid continues to grow, that kid turns into a monster just like Cain did for Eve. Eve was so excited. I got me a man from God who could be the savior of the world that he promised, and he turned out to be the world's first murderer, killer, and, and rebel against God. And he started a whole line of violent, wicked people in this world. That's what happens in our own sin. We give birth to it. We hide it. The problem is those little dudes grow fast. And they get big. And one day they're going to get bigger than you. And they're going to be larger than you, behind you. And it will be obvious. And then they come over the top of you like this. And they suffocate you. They crush you. And then sin has its way, and it comes to death. The word death here, and this will wake up a few people, is thanatos. Thanatos. It is the same word for that purple, ugly ogre who snaps his fingers and changes the universe in different time and space, I think. Um, so he, yes, thanatos is the word death, but in Greek it simply means drastic separation. It is physical separation from the way God designed you to be. Your life, your body, your health, everything, as you go, will not work out the way God designed it. In other words, as you conform yourself to sin or that, that brings you into death, you will, not inherit, you will not inherit that perfect body of the ascended Lord that Jesus has for you. It's physical death. It's thanatos. It's separation. It's spiritual separation. You cannot commune. James, remember he said last week, look and ask for wisdom. You've got to ask for the voice of the Holy Spirit. You won't be able to hear it because there's that big purple ogre Thanatos separating you from God, right? But then there's that third one, and it is eternal death. It is chronological. It is forever separated from the presence of God. And that is where James is going. James is going say, saying, that's the narrative you actually chose because it came out in your actions and in your deeds. So James's heart is, allow God to stop sin in its track. Expose it for what it actually is. Start with temptation and say, this is not of the Lord. Listen to those who can see it and are calling out, this is not of the Lord. Don't let pride cover it over. Don't let pride fuel that thing and don't let that baby keep growing. Does that make sense? Okay. Here's the chain. Temptation residing is out there. Residing in you is desire and obsession and control, and that meets the temptation, impregnating you, and what will come if it is not confessed and aligned before the Lord is your sin baby. And that sin baby will grow into a monster, and that will actually be your downfall. And James says that Christianity has an answer to this. And that Christians can conquer this temptation. I know a lot of Christians, and I've spoken with Christians, who have said, that's just who I am, so I give up. James wants us to endure. That's the whole emphasis of this passage. Resignation is not in God's plan for your life. Just saying, this is just how life's going to be. It just stinks this way. I'll try to live and ignore it. No, no, no. James wants to draw attention to it. Don't excuse it. Don't hide it. Don't walk away and say, I'm just too tired of confessing, or I'm just too tired of, of this, or it's not all that big of a deal, because it will become a very big deal. 
so Christians then, to live consistently and conquer sin and temptation, they must in turn identify and expose the temptation, and then you have to preach the gospel into your heart. It's pretty simple. It's very straightforward, but you have to know what the truth is. And that's why James gives this next command in verse 16. Do not be deceived. The word is in the reflexive. What that means is it's like don't lie to yourself. Conform your way, your walk, and your will to the will of God, his walk, and his way. Don't tell yourself that, um, yeah, it's okay to say I'm a Christian, but then go and live not like a Christian, if, that's, if I can say it that way. It's about your belief of how you, who you believe God is and what he does. Let me illustrate it by a, a tree. Uh, we often do this when we're teaching through uh, how to speak or preach the truth of the gospel into our lives. So James is very concerned. He's saying, if you're, if you're birthing sin and you're not dealing with it, then you are deceiving yourself, and you're the one that's going to come to ruin anyway. Stop lying to yourself. Preach the truth of God's story, and he gives the story now. L let me give you an illust this illustration here on the tree. When you look at uh, this picture... Uh, we need to start here. Let, let's say that sins are coming out in your life and it's becoming a poisonous fruit and that's on the dead side of the tree, okay? Pretty simple there. So you start to ask yourself in this area, what is it? Why, why am I producing this? What is the unhealthy fruit, like my feelings and my actions that are continuing to produce this misery and this consequence in my life? Well, that'll, that makes us then come back down and come into this area. In the middle area of it, we're starting to look at who we are as a person. And we're, we, it's what we believe we are. And so if we believe that we merit things, if we believe that we're owed, if we believe that um, we're entitled, if we believe that uh, God is just going to love anybody anyway, if we don't take an approach of being uh, or let me put it this way. If we don't have our identity established and founded in Christ himself, then we will look to kind of make our own Christianity by putting the rules in our lives. And we won't understand who we actually are. We will diverge from really understanding that I am a child of God I am a son and a servant. I am a warrior of Christ Jesus, and my allegiance and loyalty lies with King Christ. That's who I am, and therefore I need to live this way, and temptation and sin and these things I need to deal with right away. But if I don't see myself as that, or if I don't see these things as bad, or if my desires are so overgrown within me, then I will make my own identity and the fruit that comes out of that will actually be quite selfish and self-centered, but it'll be poisonous. The reason that we get fruit that comes out like that comes down here at the trunk. In that area, what we're starting to say in our lives is, what is it that God isn't doing for me? Because my desire is coming. What is it God's not meeting up in my life? I wanted this, but he's not giving it to me, right? He's shortchanging me. Ah, the moment that I start seeing that God's actions are not good for me, then I get down to the root. And that is, I start to identify that God himself cannot be that good because he's not fulfilling my epithumia, my desires. He's not good enough. And that is where I lie to myself. I bring God down and I bring my desire up. And we try to meet in the middle and I, and I bring it in parity. That's the danger. It's there when I think that God, I think that God is shortchanging me or he doesn't have my best interest in mind that I start making up caricatures of God. And I'll say like things like, I feel like God's just doing this to me. And especially like whack-a-mole, you know, like every time I stick my head up, God's just waiting to hit me over the top of the head. He just doesn't love me. He doesn't like me. He just, he's, he wants me to struggle. He wants me to fail. That right there is missing at our root. It's missing the understanding of the pure, glorious, and loving nature of God himself for us. 
we have a poisoned root, which will bring about poison fruit. Does that make sense? So now, what we have to do is go down and ask ourselves, what is it that I'm actually disbelieving about God himself? Why do I not think he's not good? I'll give you an illustration, a personal one. It's a close one. I'll try to be brief. There was someone years ago um, that I really admired who really, who really said some very mean things to me and in front of others. And uh, instead of receiving their affirmation or approval, I actually got their disapproval. And it, it, it kind of took me by surprise, so it spun me out, really. And it spun me out for a while. I couldn't, I couldn't go down to my roots and figure it out because I didn't know what, what, what was it that's bothering me so much. One day we were driving, and I had been praying about it again. And this, I would say this was probably a year later or two years later. And, and I was just asking the Lord, please reveal to me. And, and it takes me a little while to figure things out and, and actually listen to the Lord. But I was listening to him, and, and the Lord really impressed in my heart in that moment. And, and the Lord Jesus just said, son, what is it that you are looking for in that person that I already haven't given to you in myself? Why can't my love and my gospel and my forgiveness be enough for you? Why can't my grace and my favor over you be enough for you? Why is it that you're still agonizing over what he didn't give you when I've already given you everything? And all oh, that just hit me like a ton of bricks. And it, and it, oh, it was, hum it was humiliating. I'll just be honest with you. First, I felt really stupid because I was like, why didn't I see this before? But then I just very, felt very, very convicted. And that has been, if you will, my path out of, of that trial. It's been my path back up on the live side of the tree. The problem there was that I wasn't pleading with the Lord to restore the joy of my salvation. I didn't see God as greater in his grace. Therefore, what I needed to hear, what I needed to know, especially right here in the middle of the tree, and that is, what did God do for me in Jesus? What did he already give me in Jesus? And I had to go back to that and revel in that. So I had to go back and study, pray, and work that out. I can tell you today, I, I can say, I have victory there. I don't feel any more pain over that. Uh, regular. It might come up, might show up, but I don't. It's not an everyday thing. You know what I mean? I don't feel that because gospel truth was able to be preached into my heart. And that was God, therefore, is good. Jesus has established his goodness for me and given me his grace when I didn't deserve it. Therefore, the question became, who am I in Christ Jesus? I am his son and I press forward and I now pray and bless this other brother and I still esteem him, praise God for him. And what is that producing in my world and in my life? That is producing the feeling and the experience of godly forgiveness and humility that I need to go forward. And that's what James says. Watch. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Remember the giving God who gives wisdom. He's going to give the Holy Spirit his presence. This is the, this is the opposite of the gift of the birth of sin. It comes down from the father of lights. James often calls God the father. In this case, he adds the word of lights. Of lights uh, would mean the celestial bodies. Uh, the Jews understood that even God is the God of the cosmos and that he created all of the planets and the stars in their rotation, the sun and the moon. And then he says this, he's the creator over that. He set them on their path, but there is no variation or shadow due to change. In other words, God's not capricious. God doesn't change based on the seasons of the life that you're going through. Temptations one, temptations fall into. He doesn't do that. This is what you preach to your heart. God is there. If you watch the stars, how many of you like to, do, you're kind of astronomy geeks. You, you like that. I, I am. We just got this awesome picture of, a, of a, 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 a comet that flew by. If you guys want to see it, I got it here on the phone. Just come after the service. Okay, I'll, I'll press forward. Um, 
the, if you watch the stars, they, 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 they go on a trajectory, and sometimes you can see them at different seasons, and other times you can't. That's the shadow of turning. The moon waxes and wanes and grows, etc. It's full, and then it's just a crescent through the month over time. God's not like that. God is good, and God is good all the time. And as you appeal to him, and as he has his goodness, he wants to show that to you, and he... Even though he creates the cosmos, he will not change in his trajectory in the plan of your life. He wants to bring forth a glorious bride in beauty, in purity. He will not change. Therefore, you can trust him to not be capricious. Okay? And this good gift-giving God, who never changes, who is always seeking you, Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. The the verb there, brought us forth, is the word to give birth. It's very strange that James would use that word to speak about our heavenly father. But what is he saying? He's carrying the metaphor forward. Do you remember that chain? Temptation leads then to sin, sin to death. This is the opposite. It is God the father through his desire, his obsession, which is glorious, pure, and holy, to find you, to bring you forth, to birth you through the seed of the word of truth. The word there is message, logos, and it means the truth of the glorious Lord Jesus Christ. He came, he died, he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He died in our place, he ascended, he is there, and he is coming back again. He rules as king. When we accept that, that's the word of truth that conceives in us new life. And then finally, the new birth comes forward, and we receive Christ, and we are born again, we become alive to him, and when we become alive, we grow up as first fruits, a kind of first fruits, and This is where, to me, the word gets exciting. He says it's a kind of first fruits of his creatures. James says, God, the Father of lights of all the cosmos, has created this entire universe. And in the universe, he has sought his own. And through his message of sending his son into his own, he has impregnated you with the gospel word. And when you have received that word, he transforms you and lives in you. Now get this. Then, when you are born in him, he holds you up and says, I am forming all of the cosmos and all of heaven like you. If you want to see what heaven is to be like and a people that are redeemed for God, James says he's working it out right now in you if you're a Christian. You are a first fruit, meaning There is much more to come. If you want to see what heaven will be like, look at the way that God's will is working in the hearts of Christians. Why? Because they don't throw their lives away. They conquer temptation and sin because they can. Because I, through my will, have birthed them and given them the power of the resurrection to live against sin. I don't know about you, but that just makes my heart jump. Because God is holding us up as, can I say it this way? His model, his trophy, his joy, his treasure. You are what I'm conforming the whole cosmos to in Christ Jesus, and we are in him. That's beautiful. And that's what he's working on in us through the resistance of sin, and that's glorious. In other words, we can pray. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let Jesus reign in me right now because he's powerful than sin. He's more powerful than sin. Here's the the path to resist temptation. It was God's desire over you to enact God's word and send his son and turn his back on his own son for you so that he could do his work in this world and transform it through the way you live your life for him. How do you resist temptation or how do you conquer it? You follow God's desire. You receive his word 
and you let him do his work in you. Amen.